our final panel of the day is going to be focused more on, on pedagogy, frankly, and on techniques in the classroom. So we'll learn a little bit about oral history, a little bit about digital history, and a little bit about blended learning and how those can particularly fit into a naval classroom. Now, our first speaker in the afternoon panel is going to be Dr. Dave Winkler, who earned his Navy commission through the Penn State NROTC unit and served as a surface warfare officer during the final decade of the Cold War, which he writes about in his American University PhD dissertation on the incidents at sea agreement between the U.S. and Russia. Hired to be the staff historian for the Naval Historical Foundation, he developed an oral history program centered on volunteers that became a model for the Library of Congress's Veterans Oral History Project. A past president of the Oral History Mid-Atlantic Region Organization, Dr. Winkler had the opportunity to teach a course on oral history here at USNA in 2019 and 2020 as our class of 57 chair in Naval Heritage. He subsequently went on to serve as the Charles Lindbergh Chair of Aerospace History at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Dave. Are we on? Good. Okay, you know, first of all, I want to uh, kind of extend an apology to BJ because I didn't realize we we're going to have a Times Square billboard here. Uh, <laughs> you know, because basically I, I, I put up the uh, syllabus for my, my, uh, my class here, so you're just going to see like, you know, basic uh, sl slides. Uh, and, uh, so this, this might be the nicest uh, slide. Vietnam captured the memories of 10,000 day war at sea, U.S. Navy, Vietnam. Uh, and actually, I plagiarized the, the uh, title of the course. Uh, there is an exhibit down at the Hampton Roads Naval Museum, uh, and you're going to be thankful that I actually just uh, thrown up the syllabus because this is hard to read. Uh, but uh, Laura, Dr. Laura Orr, Orr, who works with the uh, Naval History and Heritage Command, uh, at this time, uh, back in 2019, had just opened up an, uh, an exhibit at the Hampton Roads uh, Naval Museum down in Norfolk on uh, Vietnam, uh, and the uh, oral, uh, it was oral history based. So, uh, I, you know, I, she was one of my first uh, guest speakers to come up and talk about how they approached uh, doing that exhibit. Okay, so. Basically, yeah, this is, uh, you know, well, let me just get a little background on how this course came about. Uh, I was the class of 57 chair uh, selected for the 2019-2020, uh, and I think when uh, Rick Ruth was the uh, department chair, called me up and says, great, congratulations, you're coming to the Naval Academy, you're gonna be te teaching this HH-104 class that we've been hearing all about. Uh, what else do you want to teach? And, and uh, well, I said, you know, I just finished writing a book on the history of the Naval Reserve. <laughs> Silence, you know, you, you know, so I says, well, you know, I, I also do oral history with, uh, with the Naval Historic, oral history, that's good, pedagogy, you know, uh, go, go with that. And says, I also wrote a book on the history of the Navy in the Middle East. They're all going to the Middle East. You want, yeah, that's, so that's what I wound up doing is a course on uh, U.S. Naval operations post-World uh, War II in the Middle East. And then in the spring semester, uh, we did this class on uh, oral history uh, as far as, you know, collecting and I decided I wanted to do this because, the, as I said, this is the class of 57 uh, chair of uh, naval history, and I saw an opportunity with the class of 57, Bill Perenboom, uh, you know, they endowed this chair to kind of like, uh, it's a payback, a, a thank you. And it dawned on me that these guys in the class of 57, uh, there's a good number of them, some of them went into, you know, the submarine service, you know, so. We, we don't know what they did doing, you know, Dave Rosenberg's been trying to figure that out. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, a lot of these guys uh, wound up serving in Vietnam. So I said, here's, here, here, I, I saw an opportunity. So anyway, uh, using uh, the class of 57, uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we sel uh, selected those guys. Uh, but. Uh, in the, fall sem in the fall semester, basically, I went to the class of 57. Give me all your pe people who went to Vietnam. I went their backgrounds, contact, and I got about uh, 18 or 19 uh, resumes in. I says, that's great. We're all, we're all set. All I need to do is now get a class of students and we'll pair them up. 
But basically, uh, yeah, a role in naval history uh, interpreted by those who served during that conflict. And, uh, you know, we had our course objectives, um, you know, profess uh, proficiency in the use of oral history as a, a historical method and, you know, eval comparing that to other uh, sources. Uh, think, write, interpret history through an analysis of the context, uh, uh, ex explain trends forces uh, that uh, roots of one of America's most controversial con uh, conflicts, uh, uh, study a history of professional arms, uh, and uh, you know, as a, uh, for war or, or, you know, how they use the oral history in uh, museum design. Uh, this is the Bible. Uh, Don, uh, Don Ritchie, I think this might be the, like, the 20th edition. He keeps uh, updating it. Uh, Don is the, uh, 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 I think he retired as the Senate historian, and uh, he's been a leader in the uh, oral history f uh, field. So that was a uh, one primary textbook. The other uh, textbook is Ed Marolda's uh, book, uh, History of U.S. Navy in the Vietnam War, as, as kind of like the two core uh, books, and then, then there's going to be additional readings. Um, so, I, uh, one of the things that I think I brought to the Naval Academy was my black book of uh, friends who are very knowledgeable on certain topics, and I used that black book extensively to bring in some really cool guest speakers. And the way I d developed this uh, class was to bring in the practitioners in like the first third of the class. And then uh, I, I decided in the uh, second uh, th third of the class uh, uh, is to do veteran roundtables, okay? Where we would bring in groups uh, of various, uh, you know, Brown Water Navy veterans, uh, uh, gunfire support uh, folks, uh, naval aviators. I wanted POWs, I wasn't able to uh, bring in any uh, POWs. But uh, there's some uh, really uh, heavy hitters, I consider heavy hitters. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, Denise works with uh, Dr. G uh, Regina Akers at Navy History and Heritage Command. Uh, Richard Holver, I think he's, uh, he's moved on. Uh, Jan Herman is the uh, head historian for Bureau of Medicine. Uh, and I got a twofer for him because not only did he uh, uh, do a lot of oral history while he was at the UMID, but he also wrote a book on uh, 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 the evacuation of South Vietnam in 75, uh, focusing on one of the frigates. Uh, John Sherwood is at Navy History and Heritage Command. Uh, Chuck Melson and Fred Allison were at the uh, Marine Corps University there. Uh, and, and of course, on the faculty at the time, we had uh, Mark came in, uh, Darrell Wilkham uh, brought in the Air Force perspective. Joseph Galloway, uh, you know, uh, he's passed away recently. Uh, uh, that was a, uh, we talk about book reviews. Well, his publisher sent a copy of his uh, most recent book on oral history to the uh, Naval Historical Foundation. And they're like, oh, you want your book reviewed? Yeah, you, you come talk to my class. So uh, <laughs> one of the benefits uh, that this was, as I said, the, the spring semester in uh, 2020, was it? Yeah, this is where we, COVID hit. Okay, so I sent the, you know, the class away uh, to go, uh, you know, like uh, for spring break and they never came back. Okay, so the one of the benefits of that though is that we were, I was able to bring in some folks via, you know, Zoom, such as Joe Galloway, who was down in North Carolina uh, to speak to the class. And it, another thing was they had an uh, oral history symposium, uh, you know, to talk about uh, situations such as documenting crisis and, you know, what they were thinking about is the pandemic. And uh, the symposium just happened to coincide with the classroom time. So class, you're going to be uh, involved in a uh, Columbia University oral history symposium. So that was a, that, that was a, uh, a last minute add on. But uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, Paul Stillwell and Gina Akers, they, they were a tag team. Paul, if, if you're not familiar with Paul, he's a long time dean, kind of like of oral historians with the Naval Institute. And uh, his claim to fame, was, well, he has several claims to fame, but uh, uh, you know, he did the, uh, the book on the, uh, the golden, I think it's the golden 13, the first uh, uh, African-Americans to be, uh, get commissions in the Navy. 
Gina Akers, uh, you know, she does a, a lot of women's oral history. So having those two in the class together, uh, you know, was a great combination. Here's the class. Uh, you, where, where is she? Uh, there's, uh, you saw her actually greeting your Ensign Emma Smith. Uh, uh, she, one of the students, she's uh, going to be heading off to uh, uh, Surface Warfare School here shortly, but she's, uh, I guess what you would say, a stash ensign here for the summer, doing good history work. That's uh, John Sherwood uh, and uh, uh, one of the lecturers. Uh, by the way, uh, Joe Kulk here um, was, uh, he was the senior, we had basically juniors and sophomores. Uh, he was the uh, first class midshipman. And the nice thing about here at the Naval Academy is you, I guess you appoint a class leader, section leader. So uh, he was it due to seniority. And he's the guy who actually coordinates all of the incoming uh, essays and, and sends them, sends them up, uh, you know, for publication. So uh, uh, he's going to get some recognition uh, uh, due to that. Okay, so basically, uh, here's how uh, the grading was, and we'll talk a little bit about each of these uh, different aspects of the class. Um, the ship narrative rewrite assignment, uh, basically, there is uh, the Dictionary of American Naval Fighting Ships. Um, you, you read your entry, it's kind of like boilerplate history of the ship. The ship went from here to here, you know, it, it involved in this operation. You know, it's, uh, it's a good, you know, it, it, it's a good overall what the ship was doing at the time. What I challenged the, the class to do is to take one of the, those histories from uh, the ship uh, during this time period and you take a look at Enterprise, Kitty Hawk, Constellation, Intrepid, all these carriers plus uh, some of the uh, battleship New Jersey were in countries over the, uh, during the Vietnam War time period, all right? Take that uh, Danif's history and then go get some oral histories from crew members who were assigned those ships at the time. And then I, uh, the best source uh, you mentioned, the Library of Congress, uh, their oral history program. Right now there are 25,000 oral histories with Navy sailors alone in their database, okay? I, I can't even count how many on your know, army, you know, but there, if you just go to their finding aids and search Vietnam War Enterprise, type in you know, a whole list of uh, names pop up, and then a lot of those uh, offer uh, transcriptions, or actually you, you, know, you can actually listen to the interview. So what I said here, class, this is what you're gonna do, is you take that, uh, uh, take those oral histories, Take that Danifs and inject those oral, rewrite the Danifs narratives using oral history. Bring them alive, okay? And so that was a, uh, and then we'll talk about, uh, you know, how much uh, lively the narrative is using the oral history. So that, that was the first assignment. Uh, that, that got the juices going, uh, you know, two to three pages. Uh, then a book review, of course, this is what we're talking about here, is getting these midshipmen out to the library, okay? And to actually, and what I did is before, the, you know, the semesters, I went through the stacks at Nimitz Library, and I, I started pulling books out and taking a look at the back to see how many of these books were, you know, really in the bibliographies, interviews, okay? So these are ones that I identified, uh, that were, were, uh, had a lot of oral histories. So I wanted, the, the two purposes of doing a, a book review is first of all, is I'd, uh, you know, I wanna get them experience uh, in writing book reviews, that's a, one, one thing. But also I wanted them to get familiar with the subject of Vietnam, okay? Um, there is, besides reading the Meralda book, which is you know, a nice overview, um, you know, we're going to be doing these interview sub, uh, uh, group interviews with Vietnam veterans, and they're going to be interviewing individually a uh, veteran of the Vietnam War. I, I want to get them smart. I want, you know, get, you know, get them familiar with the topic. I, I once uh, interviewed Ev Alvarez for the Library of Congress uh, uh, oral history program, and uh, he, you know, he was the, the longest uh, POW in Vietnam, and. Uh, Everybody's interviewed him to death about his experience in Vietnam. So I interviewed him about 
his experiences about being interviewed about. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, who, who's, and he said the worst interview was the first question was, okay, what war did you fight in? Okay, you know, that, that certainly, uh, you know, that was a short interview. He said the best interview, inc incidentally, was a 17-year-old high school kid in Long Island. Uh, actually uh, uh, did a lot of homework preparation. He said, uh, you know, this kid uh, generated, a, you know, he, he felt was the best interview he had ever done. So preparation, you know, knowing the subject, uh, you know, is, is so, uh, it's, it's so important. So, um, you know, this, so this uh, served two purposes. Okay, then the next uh, was team interview. So uh, basically, I, uh, we had uh, 15 uh, in the class. So I had, I divided, I think it was into uh, four fire teams, you know, fire team Alpha, uh, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. And uh, each uh, team was assigned to uh, I do it, uh, prepare for the interview with the, the group interviewees that we, we brought in. So uh, that was the, uh, and yeah, four teams. You know, one group interviewed the, the group of uh, Riverine uh, veterans we brought in. And, uh, again, this is where my uh, uh, black book uh, came into hand, or you know, my experiences at the uh, Naval Historical Foundation. So I, I reached out to uh, our members who were, uh, I think, in the uh, yeah. Well, you had Tom Cutler, okay, he, you know, uh, a veteran, and uh, Richard, Captain Richard Crulo. Uh, we had uh, uh, the Sea Wolf uh, veteran. Uh, we brought uh, Mark. Uh, you know, helped uh, bring in some uh, Marines, and we had a good round table with the Marine Corps. Vice Admiral Bob Dunn was the president of the Naval Historical Foundation, and he brought in a, a group of A-4 pilots, uh, you know, to talk uh, you know, about the air war. Uh, and then uh, Todd Creekman, who used to be the executive director of the Naval Historical Foundation, he was a surface warfare on the gun line and I think it was the 70, 172 doing the Easter offensive. You know, he brought in a, a bunch of uh, uh, other uh, Naval Academy alum who uh, were surface warfare guys. Um, the, uh, then there was the actual interview project itself where we paired up the uh, midshipmen with the, uh, the veterans. And going back, as I said, we had these packages I put together and it was like, uh, I, I, I uh, shared with the class, okay, this is like your 18th uh, veterans who have volunteered to be interviewed, and it was like draft selection day at the NFL compound. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'd be like Pete Rozelle, you know, and, and what I did is I handed out numbers to the, uh, the class, and, and they, so they would come in with their number, and they said, for the first pick, uh, and, and they, the, they would uh, pick their packages, there, there were three left on the board who uh, unfortunately never got picked. One of them, by the way, was a rear admiral. So I was kind of like, <laughs> why, why'd you, I, I guess they may have been intimidated, but because uh, the guy had a neat story. I think it was a supply officer in da, uh, Da Nang, so that would have been uh, really good. Now, one of the things which is unique about the class of 57, which makes this uh, uh, that much more of a, interesting, is that at the time, there was no Air Force Academy. Okay, so it, 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 was, it was just starting up. The Naval Academy had to provide officers for the Air Force. So not only did we have uh, veterans of the class of 57 who were not only in the Navy, uh, in the Marine Corps, but also in the Air Force. Well, I think we also had one who went into the Chaplain Corps. So it was, uh, it, it was an interesting grouping. Um, yeah, and as I said, this is, uh, uh, their goal was to uh, uh, do, do a, an interview. Uh, it was kind of neat is to record the interview and they have this uh, uh, new transcription hardware that you, uh, it's, uh, I'm trying to think, trite or, uh, but the ba basically you, you can just feed it in and it, it uh, you know, the, it, it can transcribe it. So that, that kind of made it easy. So, you know, collecting uh, the transcriptions uh, editing the transcriptions, uh, that was an important uh, component of the uh, oral history project. And then uh, uh, finally the publication is, okay, so you had 15 uh, uh, transcriptions. 
Now what you do is you take uh, the uh, 15 transcriptions and we uh, broke up time periods for the uh, uh, midshipmen. And you know, growing up, attending the Naval Academy, the first years after being at the Naval Academy. So each of the midshipmen were given those 15 transcriptions and they had to write a chapter based on secondary sources and the, uh, the transcriptions that they were given. So as a result, uh, we, uh, uh, we had 15 uh, chapters, the final chapter being retirement. Okay, I think Joe uh, Koch, uh, Koch had the, uh, got the uh, privilege of writing the chapter of being at the Naval Academy, which was a lot of, uh, that was a lot of fun. Oh, we ha had a couple of round tables with the class of 57 came in. So let's see, yeah. Book that incorporates the interviews as appendices that were presented. As a, and that's, that's kind of, that kind of wraps it up. Now, the, the final thing I had was an exam on the Vietnam War. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, COVID hits and I'm there like, wait, this is an opportunity. For the final exam, instead of doing an essay, what did you learn about the Vietnam War, which would have been a very, you know, they, hopefully they learned something about the Vietnam War. Uh, but uh, my background is a combat historian uh, with DET 206. I said, this is kind of like a DET 206, uh, you know, with the Navy History and Heritage Command, we had this reserve unit that went out in documented uh, history after it happened. Um, so this is kind of like a debt 206 type of thing. I assigned for the final exam, I found 15 individuals. Some of them were midshipmen of uh, uh, plebes all the way up to uh, you know, uh, first class. They were, I had one plebe who was living out in Iowa next to a meat packing plant. I had another uh, uh, a senior, this is uh, you know, from uh, another class, who was living in Queens across from the hospital where you know, people were dying. Uh, then we had the head of the library, we had the head of the food processing. Uh, I, I identified key people around the, the Naval Academy and their job was to go interview these people doing their final three hour final exam period, uh, capture that interview, do a write up of that interview and give me a deliverable by the end of that three hour period. So that was their final exam and as a result, uh, oh, but we tried to interview this guy, okay? The problem was he was in Hawaii, so doing the time of the exam was like 10 in the morning. That was like 3 a.m. Hawaii time. So we did get the class together at 3 in the afternoon. We did interview him as a, as a group uh, uh, project. Uh, project. That, was, that, was, that was kind of fun. So yeah, here you can see the packages, and they all picked one, and this is how the uh, final exam worked. The bottom line is that uh, those oral histories collected on COVID are now uh, in the uh, Nimitz Library, as are the transcripts for the class of 57. And, and I'll pass the, uh, the actual book around so you can take a look at, at the final product. So let's see, I think, that, I think that's it. Yeah, there they, there they are. Okay, our next presenter is gonna talk about digital history with us. Abby Mullen is a brand new assistant professor at the US Naval Academy. She comes most recently from three years teaching at George Mason University where she taught maritime and digital history courses and ran pedagogical programs on digital methods for military historians and headed up the division of the Rod Rosenwig Center for History and New Media. Her scholarship focuses on the Navy of the Early Republic, specifically the First Barbary War. Abby. All right, thank you. Where's the clicker? All right, thank you, BJ and Chris, for organizing all of this. So I'm gonna say a few things that you've already heard today, but that's okay. All right, so our first question is, how do you make this thing work? That's the best question. I am pulling the trigger. <laughs> I can advance it there, that's fine. Super. Deadness? I got it. You just give That's me the fine. Sign one. Okay. I mean, I can do it too. It's fine. All right. So we have three animating questions, as you can guess from the slide. So our first animating question is, what is the goal of going digital in the naval classroom? And I have to say, actually, this isn't going to be super naval. It's going to be mostly digital, but you can make some extrapolations. 
Secondly, what does doing digital history actually look like? And then our third question is, how do you actually do it? Important questions. So question number one is, actually, before we get to any of those animating questions, what the Dickens is digital history? And the answer is, everybody in the digital history community has a different answer for this question. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what my definition is, which is the biggest tent definition which is if you do history using computers and you do it differently than if you would do it on paper, then you are doing digital history. So let me give you an example. If you collect primary sources online and you save them in an online or a digital repository like Tropy, if you don't know what Tropy is, talk to me after, um, you're doing digital history. If you build a digital exhibit on the internet you're doing digital history. If you build a map using ArcGIS, you're doing digital history. If you make your students make a podcast, you're doing digital history. If you use artificial intelligence or machine learning to do transformations on big data, you're doing digital history. So if you're using computers to do something that you couldn't do in an analog way, you're doing digital history. So a lot more of you are doing digital history than you actually think. All right, so what is the goal of going digital in the Naval classroom? Well, to start with, it's not to be flashy. It's not to be cutting edge. We're historians, cutting edge isn't really our jam, generally speaking. So we're not doing it just to do it. There's a purpose behind what we're trying to accomplish. And the first thing is conceptual. We're doing digital history to ask questions differently or to ask different questions. Questions that are hard to answer when you're just doing traditional research in the archives or when you're reading books. All of these things are great, obviously, but digital history sometimes allows us to get at questions a little bit differently than we might otherwise do. For example, down here, this is a screenshot from a map that's part of my dissertation, which is me asking the question, where are ships actually going during the first Barbary War during the time when they're supposed to be blockading the port of Tripoli? And the answer is, they're not blockading the port of Tripoli. <laughs> I know this because you can kind of tell, but I was like, are we sure? Is it just, that's what I feel like is true, but can we actually get at that? And the answer is, yes, we can actually get at that by creating a digital map which you can go play with. It's on my website, abbymullen.org. It also helps us to think about questions that don't have answers that are easy to articulate in writing. So this is an example. It's hard to explain what's going on in this map, but it's easy to play around with this. So this is a workshop, right? Everybody take out your pens, get your notebooks out. I want you to write down right now on your notebook Either A, a question that you know the answer is out there, but you have not been able to find a way to answer it because of source problems or anything like that. Or write down a time when you knew there was a way to describe a complicated phenomenon, but doing it in writing was incredibly painful. Do you know what I'm talking about? Everybody know what I'm talking about? Write something like that down on your paper right now. All right, now tell your neighbor. What did you write down? <laughs> You're still thinking. <laughs> All right, somebody tell me something that you wrote down. Somebody tell me something that you wrote down. All right, come on, come on. Students, let's come back to order. All right, somebody tell me, what did you write down? What did you write down? Uh, what made James Barron's signal book written in the 1790s an improvement over the other? OK, a question about signal books. We could get at that using digital history because we can do lots of comparisons in digital history. I'm just going to, we don't have time to go through more than this. But think about these questions as we go through the rest here. You stay on stage. OK, all right, click. <laughs> Maybe. Wow. OK, so that was the conceptual side. There's another side, which is the practical side. 
which is that it increases digital literacy in our students. Believe it or not, students in 2022 are not what we would, we've heard the term digital natives. They don't actually know how technology works. They don't understand what the digital is, and they need to. And using digital history methodology is a way to help them figure that out. So this is an example here. This is uh, my students made a podcast about the Polaris, which you may have heard of, but most people haven't. That's why they decided to name it this. Um, but also, it increases facility in non-monographic forms of communication. Your students are not going to most of them go and write history books, but they are going to write communications to people in their different units. They are going to talk to people. They are going to have to make presentations. They are going to have to learn how to communicate effectively in a non-monographic form. I am not saying that we should not have our students write traditional essays. That is not at all what I'm saying. But there is room in our classrooms for other ways of communication. And digital history is a good way to do that because, like it or not, much of their communication is going to be digital. So with all of that said, let's move to our next question, which is not going to work. Wow. Of course, the digital history one is the one that's not working. Super. <laughs> OK, what does doing digital history actually look like? Well, it looks like a lot of different things. But I want to just show you a couple of ways that you can think about how to incorporate digital history into your classroom. And maybe we'll figure out some ideas here. So the first is in-class investigations. In other words, doing something in class that is digital in nature, whether that's looking at a digital exhibit, whether that's playing around with a digital tool. So let me just give you an example here. Oh, maybe. Here we go. This is, oh, you can't see the bottom. OK, that's fine. We can still work with this. This is a tool called Bookworm. And this is a tool that analyzes large corpora of texts, and it pulls out words. You've seen things like this. Google Ngrams does this. So here we have a graph that's showing us a comparison in the foreign relations of the United States documents that are digitized. And it's showing us, unfortunately, you can't see the years, which is a problem. But I'll just tell you, this is about 1935, and this is about 1945. So if you were to put this graph up in your classroom and say, students, what do you think is going on here? Japanese and German are the two words that we're comparing here in the documents that are all about foreign policy in the United States. Get out your notebooks. Write down what you think is going on here right now. Write it down. It's about 1935 to about 1945. All right, what do you think is going on here? Is this what you would expect from the foreign relations of the United States? Why? Why is it what, would you, what you would expect? OK, now is that what you would expect your students to say? Yeah. No. So what have we done here? We have opened up a question. We have maybe subverted some expectations. We have used this digital history tool in the classroom to start a conversation. Typically speaking, that's what in-class investigations using digital tools are good for. They're not necessarily that good for answering questions but they're good for starting conversations. So a tool like this is fantastic for that because it makes them think about what's going on in a slightly different way. Can you, can you give us a little more data on the parameters of what you're asking? Yeah, this is the entire it? foreign relations series? It's everything that's digitized, yes. So this is an interesting question, which also bears some relevance for talking about history. This is a great example of how to talk about sources. What is available to us and how we're making decisions on what our sources say. I mean, part of it just says to me that if you're talking like 1935 to 1945, the big site is the Japanese invasion of China, which becomes a significant part of American foreign policy because the Americans are trying, the American, American Republic is trying to end that. That's so exactly that's right. 
State Department, not a hell of a lot about Pearl Harbor because by that time they're not negotiating anything. Else. That is exactly really what's happening. Important, but yeah. We don't, we just, we just don't have, we don't have that. that that's exactly that. right. And you're actually making my point for me absolutely yeah, perfectly. Exactly it, well but done. But, but <laughs> Well, unfortunately, it's cut off. It's on the slide, I promise. It's just cut off the bottom of the screen. No, you're absolutely right. And this is why doing things like this is so generative. Because then, once we say, what is happening here, we say, why are these documents showing that phenomenon? Because they are about things that then leave sort of the State Department realm and move into the Defense Department realm, right? They move into the military as opposed to the State Department. That's an interesting thing that's happening, right? OK, so let's see if we can make this work. All right, so that's in-class investigations. Group projects. Everyone loves group projects, sadly. But actually, they're really great. But here are a few suggestions about group projects, especially when it comes to digital history. First of all, you want them to be too complicated for somebody to do on their own. Because <laughs> you want the group aspect of the group project. Sometimes this means doing something that's a little bit more technically difficult. Because then you have students who maybe don't feel comfortable using the technology, but they do feel comfortable doing the research. Or they don't feel comfortable being behind the microphone, for instance, but they do feel comfortable doing the audio editing. So having a group project where there are multiple different roles is really important. If they all have to do the same thing, then you know what's going to happen. One person is going to do the whole project, and everyone else is going to take credit, right? But when you have a group project where there are clearly delineated roles that are different from each other, not only is that a great way to get people to actually do things, but it really mimics how they're going to be in the world, where other people depend on them for doing different things, right, that nobody else can do. Yes, I will. Super. Eh, not important. <laughs> so group projects can be short. They can be semester long. Like I said, I did a podcast project, which was the entire semester long. But they, it really doesn't matter how long they are, as long as you can have those distinct roles. All right, and finally, homework assignments. So homework assignments are a project that you maybe demonstrate how to do in class, but then individual students go home and work on by themselves. So I'm a big fan of the contextualizing projects, like Dr. Simons was talking about at lunch, where you have your students make a digital timeline, for instance, that helps them set things in their proper chronological order. Or you have them make a digital map. You can advance to the next slide. Um, this is a program called StoryMap.js. It's fantastic. I love it. It's really easy to use, but it allows students to create a spatial timeline. So in this case, this is one I made um, about this person, Irena Wiley, who was the wife of a diplomat. She traveled all over the world, but at different times. And at each of those markers, students can write about what they what happened at that place or what's interesting about that place. And so this gives them a chance to see in the world what's happening, so spatial awareness, just like Dr. Simons was talking about. But it also gives them a chance to really show off what they think is important about their subject. And this is not something that would translate well to a paper, because it doesn't have the same kind of life to it. And so it gives students a chance to be a little bit more creative and to feel like they're doing something that is fun, because students really like doing this story map JS. OK, you can advance. So, how do we actually do this? Great question. You can start. Start small. What do I mean by this? If you've never done anything digitally in your classrooms before, you probably should not start with a semester-long complicated group project as your first thing. Just do one in-class investigation, maybe. Use that bookworm tool or look at a digital map where you can mess around with the parameters, that kind of thing. Get your own feet wet and your students' feet wet at the same time. It really is a good way to start thinking about these things, and then you can build from there. Yes. This one's a key one. In-class investigations, you have to allot time, obviously. But for any kind of thing where you're asking students to do something they have not done before, you need to allot a fair amount of time in your class to explain how to do it. This takes time. 
it takes time away from lecturing. It takes time away from sort of your, what you might think of as your normal class activities. So you do have to be prepared to a lot time. If you're doing something technically complicated like a podcast, you need to allot a lot of time. So that's something just to be aware of. Nice. This one is really, really important. Because you're doing something new that they don't know about yet, you need to make sure that you communicate extremely clearly how you're going to assess what they're doing. So does that mean you assess whether the technology works properly? In other words, does their timeline render properly? Or is that secondary to the information they're putting on their timeline is good, for instance? You need to communicate that early and upfront, but also it's worth giving them a few shots at it before you give them an official assessment. We don't actually expect people to be able to do something perfectly the first time they try it. And with some technological things, if you don't get it absolutely perfectly, it doesn't work at all. So be prepared to communicate the steps for your assessment and also exactly what you're looking for when you're assessing their work. And this one is maybe the most important thing that I've said, have a plan B. Because let me tell you, no matter how much you have prepared for your plan A, there's a good chance something is going to go wrong. For instance, if all your students have made incredibly beautiful timelines and then the Google server goes down the day before they're supposed to turn in their thing and their projects run on Google Drive, that's a problem. You need a plan B. Or let's say you're using a piece of software and some of your students only have Chromebooks. Chromebooks don't run anything, just so you know. So you should be prepared for a plan B if you have students who don't have the technological capabilities to do what you're asking them to do. I could go on about this, but plan Bs are very important. All right, final thoughts. You can give me the first one there. This is something that matters, especially for a place like the Naval Academy. If you're asking students to use proprietary software that either A, they have to pay for, or B, they have to find a way to use on campus, it's important that you say that at the outset. There was notoriously a class at my former institution where the professor asked students to purchase the license for a software that was over $200. They used it twice in the semester. That did not go over well. So if you are asking students to purchase equipment or software, Make sure that they know that in advance and that you're actually giving them their money's worth when you do it. Public scholarship, much of digital history is done in public on the internet. So this is a great opportunity for you to talk to your students about copyright and what their responsibilities are for copyright, but also what their privileges are for copyright. If they make something that goes on the internet, it is copyrighted to them by default. However, that means they can't just take anything they want off the internet because it is likewise copyrighted to the original creator by default. That's how copyright law works. So doing scholarship in public does bring its own sorts of challenges and it's worth having those conversations early and often. Uh, the tech stack. In other words, what software or what platform or what programs do you need in order to make your project work? For instance, if you use Timeline.js or you use StoryMap.js, you have to have a Google login because Google Drive is what powers those programs. That's fine, but especially here, that's fine because all midshipmen have a Google login, but maybe your institution doesn't have that. Are you gonna be asking them to make a Google login? That kind of thing. So pay attention to the tech stack. What different things are you using in order to put everything together? And then I already mentioned this, but it's really important. Make sure you allot enough time. Timing is everything. If you don't give them enough time in class to figure things out, it's gonna go badly. And if you don't give them enough time to figure things out outside of class, it's gonna go badly. So make sure you allot enough time. And finally, did I say this already? I feel like I said this already. Have a plan B. You will need it. Big projects take a ton of time. They take a ton of complications. So if you do something computational, for instance, you should assume things are gonna go terribly wrong and have a plan B. And that is doing digital history in the Naval Classroom. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Abby. And our final panelist on, uh, on this panel this afternoon is going to be Scott Mobley. Scott Mobley, Captain USN Retired, was the class of 1957 postdoctoral fellow in Naval Heritage here at the Naval Academy from 2016 to 2018. A 1978 graduate of the Naval Academy, he earned an MA in National Security Affairs from NPS and a PhD in History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In addition to his award-winning book, Progressives in Navy Blue, he's authored several articles for various professional and academic journals. During his 30-year naval career, he served on seven warships, including command of a guided missile frigate and a fast combat logistics ship. He currently teaches at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Scott. Thanks, BJ. Well, coming to Rickover Hall is a trip down memory lane for me. And, and what triggered this memory was the two preceding uh, presentations, because it's, it's, I'm going to share with you this memory, so it's oral history. And it's, very, it's, the, it's the beginning of digital history. So Abigail, it, it, it's the history of what you do. So fall of 1977, Rickover Hall was newly opened. And I was taking a, a, a history course. I was a history major here. And, and our professor took us down the basement to show you to us this most amazing thing. It was this little computer with a green you know, monochrome screen and a keyboard. We call them PCs now, but I had never seen a PC before, fall of 1977, neither had anyone else in the class. And what this professor had done working with some of the computer science people is created a very simple graphic, animated graphic of the Battle of Gettysburg, showing the little green boxes moving across the field. Um, you really wouldn't know what it was. It wasn't labeled or anything, but we, once he told us what it was, we, but it was digital history. In, the, in, in a kind of proto-digital history in the early years. And it happened right in the, the, the basement of this very building. So there you go. And yes, Craig Simons was one of my professors. <laughs> He's not here now. To, anyway. So blended learning. Well, in a lot of ways, blended learning has kind of taken the idea of, of discussion in the classroom to the next level. And what motivated me to shift the blended learning uh, well, there's a couple of things. First thing, at the University of Wisconsin, they do, just like here at Naval Academy, they have faculty training. And in 2019, I took a course on blended learning from, from uh, our, our Center for Teaching and Learning. Now, that didn't sell me, though. It wasn't until we all had to go online for COVID and we're forced to teach classes with Zoom and we're forced to do things in a different way when it comes to group discussions. And when we came out of that last year, I learned there were some really useful tools that we used on Zoom. And I wanted to kind of replicate that in the classroom. And so that's my motivation to adopt blended learning. And so I'm going to talk about that today. There's, there's three things we're going to talk about. First is, what is blended learning? Second, I'm going to share with you um, a a model, a pedagogical model on making, on learning, on making meaning that is kind of underlies the, the type of blended learning that I use. I'd originally queued up about four or five slides for that, but most of those are now deleted. I'm going to have one slide, so we're going to talk very quickly about the theory, because theory puts me to sleep, and it put, I'm sure it puts you to sleep as well. And then finally, most of the time, I'm going to share with you as many examples as I can until BJ tells me I have to shut up. <laughs> so what is blended learning? Well, blended learning, what it does is it takes what I think are the best attributes of online learning and brings them into the classroom. So blended learning happens at the intersection of classroom learning and e-learning. So what is blended learning? It is not hybrid learning. Anybody here had to teach an on online student at the same time as, as you're teaching in a classroom? Raise your hand if you have. Yeah, quite a few. My university thankfully banned us from doing that. When we went back, we went back in, in person in class, they said, you will not do that. Because inevitably, inevitably, we had students that wanted just to stay at home and, and do the online thing. So it's not the hybrid learning mixing in person and, and online students. Everyone is in the physical classroom. 
That makes it very collaborative. So the idea here is you, you supplement the instructor lecture with various types of collaborative acti activities in the classroom. And this picture is from one of my classes where we, you can see the students are doing some group discussion work. The other characteristic of blended learning is it leverages technology. You need to have devices. And Abigail, you spoke to that. And there's issues with that. Sometimes students don't. But at the very minimum, you need to have a cell phone. And I have yet to find a college student that does not have a cell phone. They may forget their cell phone, but I've yet to find one that does that. <laughs> the, you, what I have seen is the battery dies because they never charge it. But that's not a showstopper. So you've got to have a, a, a phone, a cell phone, or a, a device of some kind, or a laptop in the classroom. And in 30 to 50 percent of the classroom activities require that. Fortunately, at my, my institution, they require students to have devices in the classroom, and the university will provide one if they don't have one. And so you can see in this picture, look at all the laptops that are open. And this is important because when I was here at the Naval Academy, um, I didn't let students have devices. I made them put away their laptops, put away their phones, and they had to take notes on paper. So since COVID, I've gone 180 on that, and, and I really haven't had a problem that we have, if we have a code of conduct for using uh, devices, like you're not supposed to be doing email or tweeting and stuff like that, although who, how do you police that? I don't know. So, so this is what blending learning, blended learning is. One thing to also mention is that you can scale this. And I started this with smaller classes, 20, 30 students, but as my department kept asking me to up the enrollment of my classes, I just, I, devise methods, I adapted blended learning to these larger classes. So now I'm, on a regular basis, I'm teaching 50 to 75 students, which are medium-sized classes at UW-Madison, and we're not having any problem with this. It, it works really well, even in larger classrooms that you don't see here at USNA. Okay, here's our, here's our theory, the making meaning model. And so we have meaning equals knowledge plus experience or plus reflection. So you need all of those. And all this is saying is that it's the old idea that you take prior knowledge, then you, you graft on top of that new knowledge based on new experiences. And it's important in order to, to facilitate this process, you've got to have some time for reflection. So uh, Dr. Simons was talking about context. Think of that as knowledge. And then the new, and so context for the class comes from the reading and comes from the lecture. And then the experience, the experiential part comes from the collaborative activities that the students do in the classroom. And then reflection is something, I'll talk about that here in a minute, reflection is an often overlooked part of this process where the students really need to sit down and, and think about what they learn and try to connect it to what, what happened before. And those, that connection making time is really important. And it's really hard to have students, how many students do you know take their notebooks home and look at those notes and make those connections? Not many. So, one of the things that you'll see is that I try to make a little bit of time in the classroom to do that. All right, so here's a, clap, a typical class agenda for one of my classes. We start out with the admin, the, what I call the announcements and admin. Try to get through that as quickly as possible. I don't do that at the end of the hour because by then everybody's exhausted or not paying attention. So I do this at the beginning of the hour. Then we do a warm up to try to get everybody's head in the game. Uh, usually it usually has something to do with the reading. So it's not a reading quiz, but it's a way that the students can uh, interact with the reading they did. And, and it's usually something, a quick question or a, a quick exercise that we do. And then it leads into my lecturing. I'm trying to think of a different word. I don't like to use lecture in the syllabus, so I, I've called it briefings. I've called it remarks. If anybody can come up with a good word that does not lecture, let me know, because lecture automatically puts them to sleep. So I talk for about, you know, maybe, so the warm-up activity is perhaps five to ten minutes max. The lecture part of the class session is 20 to 30 minutes, depending on what we're talking about, what, I'm, what the topic is. And then the rest of the time is devoted to the collaborative uh, exercises, collaborative activities. I call them interactives. And, and the sky is the limit as to what types of interactives that you can do. I'll show you a few here in a moment. But you, wherever your imagination can take you, a lot of the things that Abigail mentioned would be perfect interactives in a blended classroom. And finally, I, I allow, allow five or 10 minutes at the end of the hour for this closing reflection. Uh, one caveat is that this is for 
These are for 75 minute class sessions. I've never tried this with 50 minute class sessions, so I'm not sure if it would work. But uh, yeah, so many people teach for 75 minutes, so this dovetails really nicely into that. And the other thing is you don't have to follow this one through five sequence. You can mix it up in many different ways. And I do that. Some, and I, you don't have to include every element, too. Sometimes I skip the announcements because I want to really devote the time to learning. Okay. So here's a sample warm-up activity. This is a simple polling question, and it's using an app called Top Hat. Anybody ever heard of that? So I use Top Hat. Well, actually, I haven't used it yet. I'm going to start using it next semester. I used a different app before. But this one, this, I have to pay for the other one myself, so I'm going to use this one now. Top Hat, that's what the university has. And it's a poll question that references the day's reading assignment. And uh, it takes about five to ten minutes in class, and that includes the polling and the discussion afterwards. And uh, low instructor effort, which is important, because one thing about the blended classroom is that it's pretty structured, and, and you've got to have plan Bs. Plan Bs are important, like Abigail said, and, and plan Cs because sometimes it just doesn't go the way you want. Anyway, so here's the question. This is a, a sample warm-up, and it's just saying, uh, this is, we te I teach in Wisconsin, so I say, what Wisconsin native established at JCS? And they have a list of famous Wisconsinites, or, well, Douglas MacArthur isn't, but his father was. Um, and most people, for this one, they either vote for Fighting Bob La Follette, who is a, a, a Wisconsin politician from the early uh, 20th century, or they vote for Douglas MacArthur. And they're, so they're surprised to see that it's fighting Bill Leahy, <laughs> who's from Ashland, Wisconsin. So, and that gets the, I get their attention with this. And then we go on to a conversation in this particular lesson about the JCS, its origins, what it does, yada, yada, yada. So that's a, a great way to introduce a topic with a quick warm-up activity. So next, uh, we have, I, so we have, usually there's 20 to 30 minutes devoted to, to the, the interactive, the collaborative activities. Early in the semester, most of that time is basically getting them used to how to do these. And so you're spending up to 10 or 15 minutes just getting it set up and getting people in the right place and so they can figure out what they need to do. But as the semester goes on, they get used to it. You can vary these activities, but the basic ground rules are the same. So they, it, there's a lot less uh, investment in time to set up and more, more time for learning. So, um, so this particular group activity is a, a kind of a mini case study. It's a group activity, so the students are divided into groups. Um, the, uh, blah, blah, the deliverable in this case is a sequence of polls. We had a poll for that warm up. This is another way to use polling. And then in class, you give them 15 to 20 minutes to do the, do, do the activity, and that would include the time, this, the kind of the wrap-up discussion at the end of the activity. And it requires a fair amount of instructor prep, but not, not a huge amount. So in this one, what I do is I give the students a, this is kind of recent naval history. It's a, a case study uh, from the media based on interactions in the South China Sea. So they read this, and you don't have to read this. So I'm not going to stay on this slide. And then I give them a series of polls based on the material from the reading and the lecture. This might not make much sense, but if you took my class, it would. And so in this case, they have to make selections based on the question about classifying China's exercise of state power. And, uh, and then they, they go ahead and poll on this. I open it up. We watch the results in real time. It's a lot of fun to see the results come in. This uses a different app called Poll Everywhere which I really like, but my university won't pay for it, so we're going to Top Hat. And, and so it's fun to see this dynamic thing happening in the class where the graphs go up and down and people change their minds. And then we, I close the poll, and then we talk about the results. And often what I'll start out and say, so what is this telling you? And usually after waiting a minute or two, there's some brave soul that raises their hand, and, and then that gets the conversation going. Or sometimes I'll tell the groups to discuss it, so what is, you know, talk within your groups for a couple minutes, and then I'll, I'll ask the groups what happens. So there's different ways you can do that. Then you go into the next question, and you might have two or three poll questions. Uh, these, this one interacts with the previous one a little bit. It's meant to be a little bit confusing, so it would be thoughtful. But you, you can do that kind of stuff 
in this environment because even if it's confusing, that gets people's attention. They try to work through the problem, and if they can't in the, in the amount of time allotted, you, you can always kind of bring it together, and the students themselves can explain it to each other. So it's really a helpful approach. So here's another interactive. This is I call open-ended discussion. So it might be based on a case study, it might be based on reading or the lecture, the lectures or whatever, and basically you pose a set of questions to the groups. Again, they're in groups. You pose a set of questions to the various groups, and then they respond. But they respond on a Google slide so that you've got every group, and when there's 75 students in the class, and I keep my groups at about five, there's like 15 groups. But you can scroll through those slides, and they know the professor is scrolling through because they see it in real time. And, and so you, you, they, they're kind of forced to respond. You force this conversation. You force the response. But uh, usually we run out of time. Usually they can't answer all the questions because there's so much discussion going on. So this one's a little bit more. It might be 20 to 25 minutes. Again, it requires some prep. And this is an example of one of the Google Slides that, uh, from a, an exercise that we did. Uh, this one's talking about uh, election interference, which does relate to naval history and national security, because uh, this was foreign powers attacking US elections. And so uh, there's a series of questions. In this case, I, there's two questions that they need to ask. The first one is kind of list stuff, and then the second one is, is more um, evaluative. So it requires them to really make those connections. But it's very easy to put in uh, naval history variations of this. And I actually did this, used uh, naval history variations in this type of activity when I was teaching here in 2016 to 2018, although I did not use Google Slides. We just wrote them on the, on the, the, the whiteboard. Finally, uh, in terms of uh, interactives, this one's easy. It's muddy points. And many of you probably already do this. So it basically, what I like to do is have the students, they're in their groups. Each group has to generate a question. Sometimes I have them populate a Google slide with a question. That way I can see and I can pick which ones we're going to talk about. Other times, I just have them raise their hand and ask. And uh, the beauty of muddy points is that it requires no prep time at all, other than making up the slide. This is an excellent plan B. You can always do muddy points. And then uh, I mentioned the closing reflection. So this is a, a big part of my class session. And thus far, I've been doing this now for two years. I've always been able to carve out those five to 10 minutes. So I give them a few minutes at the end of class, and they respond to something I call a focus question. Again, this doesn't require very much prep. You just got to think of the question. And here's some samples. Uh, I, sometimes I ask a general question, particularly if I'm tired and it's the day before and I haven't thought anything. So I just say, what did you learn today? And you'd be surprised what they come up with. Um, sometimes it's more specific. You can see the second question is, is a bit more narrow. But it always asks a question about how and why, because you're trying to get them to make connections. And, and I found these work really well. And I had them populate a Google form. They basically navigate with their devices to this Google form. And, uh, and there's a link available in the learning management system. And they, they, they respond to the question. So you can see all the responses. And I actually read them. And it's really enlightening to see um, how they respond to the questions. Sometimes a little disappointing. I've created a new rule now that has to have at least 30 words. <laughs> I didn't do that before. Before, I just said honest effort. But th so 30 words of honest effort. Um, all right, so there's the ending reflection. There's actually references for this. And uh, so I threw, a f I threw a few up here. You might be familiar with some of these works, particularly Lang's work. But uh, so there is a pedagogy. There, are, there is guidance online in, in these sources that will help you. And that is it. All right, if we could have our panelists all come on up. Grab yourselves a chair. OK, we'll, we'll finish up our last session with a, a little bit of Q&A. And then uh, I'll give a little quick briefing gouge on what follows, the buses home, et cetera. So don't worry, I'll get to that. Mark, you got the first question. Scott, I thought, I thought that was very interesting. I really like your presentation. I have two 
question. First question, you have the students doing lots of different things during the 75 minute class, it seems like, and, and, and is that, it seems like it works really, really well. Is there a reason why that works, do you think, maybe, the fact that maybe attention spans are a little deeper <coughs> on the generation? Second question, or here's the question, second question, instead of instructor remarks or lectures, have you considered, Dr. Scott, probably, probably not. <laughs> that is a good idea. And some of my some of my lectures are actually in the historical narrative, particularly early in the semester when we're doing something called foundations of feminist science. It's just it's a very interesting one. And I just tell a story. Mm -hmm. I just did a I think you saw the question about lecture meddling and the lecture meddling about lecture meddling um, in in the in the seventies and nineties. It was about attention. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 So, yeah. I one of the reasons I want to get to my third topic is I'm not going to make you an anthropologist or a scientist or a scientist. So, I need to do something kind of different. So, yeah. Usually in a 75 minute period, there will be maybe two students per day. After about 30, 40 minutes, you can see in the audience that they want to do a brain check. So this is the big definitely that time. I always put the junior interaction at the end. Thank you. Sir. Hi, I'm Joe Gregg. There's a certain uh, amount of content that the course covers. Do you find that you're sacrificing some of that content? And that's the trade off if you don't want to do this kind of activity? Yes. Average student, and 
Denise. to enhance what you see in the buildings. 
online by providing more context, by using the sources that you have at the library. And actually, I'm just going to shout out Newman's library here because I was messing around on their website the other day. And they have this really cool map where you can see the modern day Naval Academy. And then as you like to scroll around on it, you can see the historic map and uh, documents and stuff. Yeah, I actually so, need that. So, well done. It's awesome. So that's a great example of something where if I walk around the buildings here of the Naval Academy, yes, I can see that one of them is named Rick over Hall. But if I go to that map, I can find out, like, who is Dr. Rick over? And why is it ironic that we're in this space today, right? So, um, so I think digital exhibits and things like that can really enhance uh, places in situ placeness, so to speak. <coughs> <laughs> Heather. Um, to, to kind of go off of that, um, I, yeah, I, um, I, one of the themes that I've noticed throughout today um, is pretty much just not only um, interdisciplinary kind of cooperation, um, but in terms of students um, being able to access different uh, disciplines that they may not have had an opportunity to be a part of or even knew existed. And um, uh, you've been talking about um, oceanography and, and um, you know, those types of scientific disciplines that historians typically want to run at high from. Um, my, uh, I wanted to comment that um, I, I would hope that everyone in here um, would also find it possible to um, work with other institutions and kind of going off the Colonial Williamsburg um, example, um, when I was at Auburn University, we did um, a GIS model of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. It was a huge digital history project. And you can also work with the local community as well. Um, and I feel like that's also something um, that students, regardless of where they are, whether they're here um, in South Carolina, uh, at Auburn, um, can learn more about their local history uh, by working with different departments, by working with new technologies, um, because eventually um, all of that work can uh, be digitized to become digital history. Um, so that way when students are confronted with history in the last 70 years, um, uh, so for the, the Edmund Pettus project, eventually it will be a three-dimensional history in which you will put goggles on and it will place you at the Edmund Pettus Bridge during Bloody Sunday. And it will be intense. Um, and that's, again, that's something at Williamsburg that you can't necessarily replicate, right? Um, and I feel like that's also bringing emotion into history, which I feel like historians kind of want to not touch on that unless it's um, you know uh, veterans histories um, in terms of oral histories discussing PTSD is really 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 hard um, and you have to be really cautious um, with things like that. So um, that was the commentary that most people on um, panels really hate is when people raise their hand and say I have a question, but then it becomes a comment. <laughs> so I apologize. I will admit that I was um, but. Excellent. Thank you. All right. We'll take one last question. Charles. Okay. Charles Webster, Mountain State Community College. I think everything you say is excellent. I do actually have a question. Um, one of the things I think we've come back to throughout today is the question of discipline. Right? And I think that's where we're going with this. If someone who works in a community college setting, they're going to have to think about how does that discipline work? And how do they think about discipline? 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 And how do they think about not work out in terms of like resource access, resource accessibility for some digital learning or learning. How do you guys kind of overcome that? And, and not just because we think about the example from earlier, Chromebooks, you know, use Chromebooks that may not work in some classrooms or some software that goes to the or you know, the public tech stacks and most of you don't access to that, or you don't have a laptop, you don't have an iPad, so then they don't have more than anything. You still have your C class be successful when you get to plan C. Well, one of the things I, I, I have to tell, of course, the students know. Um, when it comes to actually like, having the device, you really need to have it to do it for it to work in, in the library classroom. And there are resources on campus for students that may not have that. And so, 
one of the things I do is up front, I mean, even before class meets, when I welcome her, I talk about it. Only when you have advice, please contact me uh, privately. You can do it with the order of the embarrassment. Contact me privately. You can make those arrangements. And I know who to talk to like, in my department for checking out uh, a, a laptop that you can use in class in, in that sort of thing. So, part of the number of resources are you only have to get two. Um, the other part of this is when you choose apps, and Abigail talked about this, you can't pick an app that costs 300 bucks. Or that only runs on iOS. Right, right. So you have the, both the, the, the uh, polling apps that I showed are, are free for the students. Uh, the way it works out, even the one I have to pay for, they don't have to pay for it. They just need to be able to access it and never talk. So you, you choose software. That is low cost or low cost. And I'll just say that I think um, the technology issue really came home after spring break in 2020 because students went home to sometimes technology deserts. Uh, I had students at, in that semester who were sharing one household computer with three other people who were trying to do online learning. That's not conducive for anyone's online. Um, so one of the things I did that semester, which I've replicated since then, is at the beginning of the semester now, um, I do something similar where I actually send out a Google form and I do a technology survey to ask students what they have. So do you have access to a tablet? Do you have access to a laptop? Are you able to use you know, Wi-Fi or cell service, that kind of thing? I mean, I had a student who lived in somewhere very rural in Tennessee, which may be relevant for you actually, who basically had cell service like two hours a day and no black time. So that meant that in my class, which was called the digital pass, um, it was difficult. It was difficult for that student to do their work. And so it's, I think it's important to know going in those issues and things are gonna come up, of course, um, there's a particular software, which I teach, even though it doesn't throw a Chromebook, because I think it's important, but I have a workaround for students who have Chromebooks, for instance. So again, this is where the iteration comes in. You're going to hit roadblocks. You have to be creative. And then the next semester, you build the roadblocks in. But I think uh, knowing in advance what technology is available really helps. And then if you have students who don't legitimately have nothing to work with, then you can figure out if your university has resources, or actually there's other institutions or organizations that often do grants for technology purchases for students. So if you feel like that's going to be an issue, looking into some of those things in advance, but also being really cautious, again, with the privacy issue. So nobody else needs to know that your student doesn't have device or whatever that's between you and the student. So not making a big deal out of anything, but just being really flexible with the students about that. Yeah, just a short follow on that. I just, I just want to uh, commend the Naval Academy uh, because, uh, it, as far as resources concerned, there's a writing center here. So I brought in the team from the writing center to talk to your all history class about you know, uh, you know, creative writing and how to, how to go about it. Uh, also, the uh, library, uh, Mike McCann came into the class and talked about the resources that are available in Nimitz Library. So, uh, I think al almost all the HH 104 classes and professors take their uh, classes over there for an introduction se session. You know, they get them, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, into the stacks and, and, and what, what the other resources are. All right. Thank you to our panel. <laughs>